Mental Models 30 Thinking Tools That Separate the Average from the Exceptional Improved Decision-Making, Logical Analysis, and Problem-Solving Written by Peter Hollins Narrated by Russell Newton Copyright 2019 by Peter Hollins Production Copyright by Peter Hollins Systems thinking is a fascinating thinking tool that expands our cognitive horizons, if used well. However, what well means, and what people understand under the aegis of thinking in systems, may vary. This cognitive method stretches beyond simple rules. People who become interested in learning about systems are usually fascinated by the complex diagrams, like causal loop diagrams, or other management simulation tools provided by systems thinking. They think that by learning to use the tools, it will help them fix their problems. But systems thinking isn't only theoretical knowledge. It has a strong connection to the events that have happened and are currently happening in our world. Whatever happens in the world has a cause and effect, and this effect can spill over and create some unintended consequences. Other events have a circular nature that feed back to the structures responsible in creating them, there can be blind spots and powerfully influencing laws in the systems we're not cognizant of. We can also be totally unaware of some of our own contributions to a negative or positive change. For example, if we make a mistake and we're treated with blame instead of understanding and a genuine intent to right our wrongs, we become rather defensive. We close our minds off from learning opportunities in our self-righteousness, thus we don't improve and we become even more prone to making errors. We enter a vicious cycle of blame and error. What's the way out? You'll learn in this book. Systems thinking done well, therefore, is more than learning to use a model. It's a knowledge thanks to which we understand and comprehensively see complex phenomena by using models while expanding our awareness to the interconnectedness of the problem we're analyzing. We can use systems thinking to diagnose problems just like a good doctor following the analysis, diagnosis, solution trio. We first take a look at the problem at hand, profoundly understand what's happening, and start taking action only when we are secure in our diagnosis. By slowing down, we can see connections we couldn't before. We can ask better questions and arrive to more accurate conclusions. An analysis in system thinking often looks like this. We observe the data or occurrences related to the problem, trying to find patterns that repeat themselves over time. These patterns then can help us find the underlying structures of the problematic system. When we have a structure modeled out, it's easier to fine-tune interventions that create positive changes. Using these models, we can broaden our solution or intervention palette that may lead to better, longer solutions. The main qualities of someone who is thinking in systems are curiosity, clear vision, openness to alternatives, courage, and compassionate understanding. People who want to be good at systems thinking need to be open-minded and crave to understand the problem from every angle. This means that sometimes they need to abandon their opinion and embrace something that is contrary to their general thinking pattern. This kind of openness helps them embrace the stance of others, realize that problems are interconnected and never black and white, and accept that often there are multiple solutions to an issue. Why should you learn to use systems thinking? First, because this type of thinking allows you to find more solutions to a problem and a greater chance to find the best solution among them. You can expand the borders of your thinking, see problems in a new light, and articulate your diagnosis with more certainty. Second, because while you'll be able to identify more solutions, you'll realize that there is no solution without an impact on other areas of the problematic system. Every choice, every intervention we do is ultimately a trade-off. By being mindful about possible consequences, we can decrease the negative impact of the intervention. Using systems thinking, we can make better and more transparent decisions. Third, the language and structure of systems thinking helps us present a problem better. We can tell a better story. Tools like loop diagrams and graphs can help you build a visual behind the story, which further deepens understanding. 
System thinking can be useful in solving many kinds of problems, but it helps a lot, especially with the following. Important or urgent problems. Predictably reoccurring problems. Unpredictably reoccurring problems. Problems that couldn't be fixed before, despite attempts. Problems that got fixed only on a symptom level. Whenever you decide to take a closer look at a problem, refrain from blaming. It's tempting to point the finger to someone or something specific. He's lazy, that's why the company struggles. Or, she's a bully. It's easy to cast blame on someone, but naming a scapegoat almost never fixes the issue. What's the alternative? I'll present it in a later chapter, but for now, I'll only hint that approaching the problem from a position of curiosity, bringing it to the discussion table by asking exploratory questions, can go a much longer way. Instead of making statements, ask questions such as, Why is this problem a problem? Are there any aspects of this problem we don't understand? What are the most significant patterns in the problem? What outcome does the problem generate? What outcome would we like instead? How does the problem look on the following four levels? Events, patterns, structure, and mental models. It's smart to keep your assumptions in your conscious awareness and tell yourself that whatever you assume, others may see the same picture differently. Others may operate with different assumptions and experiential background. It's important to map out and understand those perspectives to find a widely beneficial solution, especially if we're talking about problems within an organization, workplace, classroom, company, social group, etc. When we start investigating an issue, we need to bring everyone to the table, involve the different interest groups, and map out mental models together. This process can lead to solutions you'd never dream of. A teaser of some of the most typical systems thinking tools. A. Causal loop diagrams. When it comes to causal loop diagrams, less is more. The goal of this diagram is to illustrate the problem in a simple way. You can add more items to the diagram as you progress in the story, but start by presenting the problem with the most necessary parts. A standard diagram may be sufficient to jumpstart the brainstorming session about alternative paths to look at the issue. If the issue is more complex, it's better to use multiple simple loop diagrams to illustrate the interrelationships between the elements of the system. Contrary to what many people think about complexity, in causal loop diagrams, it's acceptable to leave out elements and variables which don't make a change in the system and therefore are irrelevant to the analysis. Complex doesn't need to mean complicated. The best causal loops show the connections and relations between the elements of the system and highlight the aspects that we are not conscious of. Loops are the simplified representations of the present. We'll learn about such loops later in this chapter. B. The Iceberg Model When they were on their tragically ill-fated journey, the Titanic could have likely weathered the crash if it were not for the terrible damage caused to it by the massive portion of the iceberg that lay beneath the surface. This is much the same case when people in a system are faced with a problem. At first glance, the concern and immediate focus may be on the tip of the iceberg that they can see, the event. Focus then immediately turns to figuring out what happened, with the concern being wanting to react to it quickly so that the fire, or ice, can be put out. But if you want to address more than the symptoms and get to the root cause of the problem in order to prevent it from happening again, you can't spend all of your time near to dealing with and reacting to the event. You need to dig deeper, because that is where the real issues reside. And these shape the events as well as the trends, patterns of behavior over time, which allow us to forecast and predict what might come next. The iceberg model distinguishes between the symptoms and the real problems, exposing the underlying system structures. The structure is where you'll find the policies, dynamics of power, perceptions, and purpose. If left unchanged, the structure is where the vast majority of damage to the system will come from, as the trends and events will continue to repeat themselves. 
The deeper your understanding of the system's structure, the more likely you'll be to change the system's behavior in the long term. Let's talk about the levels of the iceberg you can see in the iceberg model. 1. The event level. People perceive the world at the event level most of the time. For example, waking up in the middle of the night realizing that you're thirsty is an event level analysis. Event level problems can often be solved with a simple correction, like drinking a glass of water. However, the iceberg model encourages us to dig deeper instead of automatically assuming that the problem we're facing is indeed an event level problem. Instead of just reacting to our thirst, let's dig deeper. 2. The Pattern Level When we look beyond events, we often identify patterns. Events with strong resemblance have been occurring with us over time. We've been very thirsty during different parts of the day. Maybe we are dangerously dehydrated. Acknowledging patterns helps us forecast and forestall events. 3. The Structure Level When we try to find the answer to the question, what's the cause of the pattern we are observing, we usually conclude that it's some kind of structure. Because of our increased workload in the heat of the day, we often forget to drink enough water, and this has taken its toll on our body in the summer heat. Professor John Gerber informs us that structures can include the following things. Physical things. Stores, sidewalks, or benches in a park. Organizations. Corporations, hospitals, and schools. Policies. Regulations, restrictions, or taxes. Rituals. Subconscious behaviors. 4. The Mental Model Level the fourth level of the iceberg are the mental models, which are the collection of the attitudes, beliefs, expectations, morals, and values that provide structures continuous functioning. For example, the beliefs we subconsciously adopt and carry on from home or from our school, work, and surroundings. In the case of our dehydration, the mental model creating it could involve the belief that our job is more important than our health, that we need the money, or that by taking a short drinking break, we might appear weak or lazy. C. The Archetypes Systems archetypes are commonly repeating variations of feedback. Each archetype has a typical pattern of behavior over time, structure, and effective interventions. These archetypes help us to understand and quickly diagram the behavior of a system. The more you practice systems analysis, the easier you will notice and apply the structure when hearing an archetypical system story. Some systems can cause troublesome behavior through their structure. This trouble can take many forms. Some of the behaviors these archetypes create include addiction, low performance, and escalation. It isn't enough to just recognize the troublemaking structures and understand the problems they cause. They need to be changed. People often make the mistake of trying to blame other people or events for the destruction these archetypes cause. In reality, the fault lies within the structure of the system. So, what can be done? We can escape these so-called system traps by being aware of their existence and using that knowledge to avoid getting caught in them. We can change the structure by revisiting our goals and developing new ones. We can work with the feedback loops to strengthen weaken or alter them, or even add new ones to the system. The system's archetypes rapidly build systemic awareness and provide a simple and engaging way to communicate about systems to others. They're easy to understand. Working with classic stories helps people shift their thinking to a more systemic perspective. The classic stories are also an easy means of transferring learning about systemic issues from one situation to another. If you successfully master the system's archetypes, you'll be familiar with the storylines and regular patterns of behavior over time. You'll detect them in real-world events and map their structure with ease. Also, by going deeper, you'll be able to improve and enrich the structure of the specific system you'll be analyzing, adding implications for leveraged interventions. The nine most common systems archetypes are the following. Shifting the burden, fixes that backfire, 
Growth and Underinvestment, Tragedy of the Commons, Limits to Success, Accidental Adversaries, Escalation, Drifting Goals, Success to the Successful. When you tell a system story with the help of an archetype, try to keep it simple if you're presenting it to people who are unfamiliar with systems thinking. In case your crowd is interested, you can tell them more about the archetype in question, but don't try to over-mystify the story with complicated terms people can't connect with. The best results come when people can find their own connection to the archetype in question. You can, however, facilitate understanding with simple yet widely known situations people can relate with. For example, when trying to explain escalation, you can refer to the arms race in the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. Test your knowledge. Systems thinking is a skill that won't show itself in obvious ways. The more you practice the principles presented in my The Systems Thinker book series, the more emerged you become. Here are some tips to test your knowledge. The quality of your questions about approaching problems changed. Blaming and reductionist problem-solving slogans make you alert. For example, when you hear, the issue is that we lack capital, knowledge, etc., you'll feel the need to ask questions that point beyond the simple problem diagnosis. You start to attribute certain problems to reinforcing or balancing feedback loops. You start mapping out mental models to think about an issue. You start to look for leverage points and bottleneck issues. Many of these concepts may sound foreign to you, but don't worry. I'll explain each of them in this book. The main focus of the current book is, however, mental models. If you wish to read more about system archetypes, read my book, Learn to Think in Systems. Learning to use a systems thinking perspective together with its tools, like causal loop diagrams, mental models, like the iceberg model, and archetypes, will give you enough information to help you detect problems. To advance in your skills, study the archetypes, read the news, and approach stories from a systems thinking point of view. Tackle your workplace and personal life problems by looking at them as an outcome generated by the system you're in, and accept that there are limitations to fix certain issues. This has been The Systems Thinker, Mental Models. Take control over your thought patterns. Learn advanced decision-making and problem-solving skills. The Systems Thinker Series, Book 3. Written by Albert Rutherford. Narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2020 by Albert Rutherford. Production copyright by Albert Rutherford.